Hey there, posture guys and gals, and welcome back to the Correcting Common Posture Deviation Series. As always, I'm your host, Justin Archer, aka The Posture Guy, your number one source on pain, posture, and performance. And today, we're going to be going over not one, but two posture deviations that, when combined, can be quite troublesome for the average person, but when applied to the average or professional athlete, can be downright deadly. Now, I don't mean deadly in the sense that they're just going to drop down on the ground and have a heart attack and die, but deadly in the sense that if they currently have these posture deviations and they don't do anything to rectify them, then it will most certainly lead to open themselves up for a higher chance of injury, which will then you know, sideline them for weeks, months, years, and worst case scenario, permanently, thus killing their athletic careers and other athletic endeavors. All right, and we don't want that. So all you athletes out there, pay attention, all right? You know who you are. However this thing goes, I don't know. Um, anyways, this can be applied for really any sport, you know, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, volleyball, anything that ends in a ball, uh, bodybuilding, dancing, ping pong. Yes, that last one's a sport, and we prefer that you call it table tennis. I'm just saying, I'm just putting it on the table, okay. Um, so anyways, uh, wasting no further time, uh, we'll get right into it. So we'll go over the posture deviations separately and then combine them. And I encourage you uh, to stand up and kind of go through these, these movements and positions with me, okay? So number one is anterior pelvic tilt. And what that looks like is, it's easy to see from the side, so I'll show it to you from the side view, is here's my natural pelvic tilt. Basically my waistline is pretty you know, straight across. And then here's an anterior pelvic tilt. Here's regular, and there's the anterior. And basically what it looks like is, you can see now my waistline, the elastic band in my shorts, has now tilted forward. Or if I was wearing a belt, <clears throat> my belt buckle would be significantly lower towards the floor, and the top of the belt buckle, or in this case my waistband, is hiked up higher. Okay? You can also notice that there's an increased curvature in my lower back, this uh, lordotic curve, and the extreme curvature is what we refer to as lordosis. Um, another way to think about this anterior pelvic tilt is think of your pelvic bones together forming a bowl filled with you know, fruit punch, Gatorade, water, whatever, and is it tilted far enough forward that that liquid would spill out the front? If so, you have an anterior pelvic tilt. One to five degrees of anterior pelvic tilt forward is acceptable. Any more than that, we need to correct and get it back towards more of a neutral position, okay? Now, if standing in either of those positions, uh, or that one position, Hurts, uh, then another way you can test out is laid on the ground with your legs up at a 90 degree angle, so your body's like this, and while you're down there, just within the first minute, don't get comfortable, ask yourself, do you feel an arch in your lower back? If so, you have an anterior pelvic tilt. If you don't feel an arch, then you don't, okay? So that's the anterior pelvic tilt. Uh, the posture deviation number two is externally rotated femurs. So healthy femurs, healthy positionally, health, healthily positioned femurs, excuse me, would look something like this. You know, now we're not looking at the actual thighs, the femurs, the thigh bones. What we're doing, because that's kind of hard to see even in people who you know, have pretty well developed muscular thighs, we're looking at the kneecaps, because the kneecaps sit on top of the femur at the end obviously here, and they're kind of windows into the hip as far as how is the thigh bone positioned in the hip socket. If they're positioned straight, then the kneecaps will point straight ahead just like mine are. But if they're externally rotated, you'll see this where now you can see this knee, you know, my body's pointed this way, but my, this knee's pointed out that direction, and this knee is pointed off this direction. So think of them as headlights in a car, and they should point straight ahead. Now, if you try this yourself, you'll notice it kind of puts some torque on the knee. Maybe you might even call it, you know, painful. And what you're gonna instinctively want to do to release that torque is turn your feet out with it, and then you go, oh, that feels better. This is something that you'll usually, not always, but usually see with people with external uh, femur rotation is that they're turning their feet out to lessen the amount of, of torsion, of torque on the knee joint, okay? So that's what external femur rotation looks like. Now let's mix the two. So go ahead, go on that anterior pelvic tilt, and then add to it the external femur rotation. And I want you to stand like this for, you know, maybe 20, 30 seconds, and then also walk around with that posture. And let me know what you feel, what symptoms and or physical limitations you notice. Me personally, in that anterior pelvic tilt, I notice tightness in my lower back. I wouldn't call it pain, but if I stayed here for you know a couple hours, it would definitely turn into pain. Uh, and it could be considered anything from lower back pain, but that could lead to things like herniated disc, 
Uh, it could learn. It could excuse me lead to uh, compression of the disc, and then the vertebra uh, rubbing together, causing spondees, which could then lead to uh, an impingement of the sciatic nerve. So then you're getting burning, tingling, numbing down one uh, leg or the other, or both. Um, so that's just in the low back. Moving down to the hips in this position, I feel tightness on the front of the hips, but more so on the sides. And that's a result of that external femur rotation, because you gotta think, here, that's how your thigh bone is supposed to fit in your hip socket. You actually rotate it, and now the femoral head, the, the head of your femur inside the hip socket, is now hitting it at a different angle. And so when you go to swing your leg, like in a walking uh, position, it's gonna be kind of grinding away at the, at the hip joint capsule. And yes, you do have protective cartilage in there and you have a bursa sac to secrete synovial fluid, but if given enough time in that externally rotated position, it's gonna wear through that. And then you get things like, you know, an arthritic hip and you get uh, inflammation of the bursa, known as bursitis, and things like that. And we see people then, you know, nowadays in mid 40s getting hip replacements. And it's like, what the heck? You know, hips are designed to last 100 plus years. But you look at pictures of these people in their 40s, 50s, or 60s that have had hip replacements, and you see that just a few years before the hip replacement, they were standing, legs turned out at 45, maybe even 50 degrees, like this, and it's like, oh, well, you know, no wonder, you were just grinding away at your hip until there was nothing left, therefore you needed a hip replacement. Finally, moving down to the knee joint, and we already kind of covered this a little bit, um, but, you know, when you try to externally rotate the knees and you felt that torsion, well, you can lessen it by turning your feet out, and now you probably don't feel it really as much, but try to walk in a straight line, or better yet, run with feet turned out like that. Now, I know you could will yourself to walk or run in a straight line, but think about what's going on in your knee to compensate in order for you to do so. So, really, if you were to walk, you know, heel, ball, toe, and come off, your knee is a hinge joint, right? And it just synchronizes the power between the hip and the foot slash ankle. So it just opens and closes like so. But now with it actually rotated, you land, and to walk a straight line, you have to internally rotate to some degree. And what's going on now is your knee joint has become, it's not just a hinge joint, but it also has some rotation in it. And it starts grinding away at all the cartilage in there. And then it's no wonder why you go to, your knee hurts and you go to the doctor and they go, yeah, you have some loss of cartilage, you have a meniscus tear, or maybe you, know, you were playing a game and you blew out your ACL, your MCL. You know, the list goes on and on as far as problems you can have with the knee. But obviously, if it's not in that correct position, it's not going to operate the way it was designed, like a hinge joint. It's the same way I tell people, you wouldn't, if you went out next morning uh, and your car's front wheels were turned out at 45 degree angles, you wouldn't even get in the car. You wouldn't even drive. You would call your mechanic or have it towed or something. And if you did drive it, imagine trying to drive that car with wheels turned out opposite directions in a straight line. You'd be holding that wheel with all your might. The car would be shaking, you'd hear grinding noises, probably parts would be falling off of it. Well, guess what? The same thing happens inside that knee joint, okay? Now, let's turn our attention to physical limitations. So if you have that anterior pelvic tilt, what I want you to do is try to lift your knee as high as you can. That's about it for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> to get the knee up higher, what do you have to do? You have to let it go into a more neutral or even posterior, what we call flexion position, okay? So now I can get all the way up. But if I try to hold that anterior tilt, I can't. So imagine that getting away when you're trying to hurdle something, whether it be another player or maybe in sport and track, an actual hurdle. You kind of can't do that because you're fighting your own body's mechanics. Okay? Um, and we already talked about you know, trying to run, and running is included in any sport, with knees and feet externally rotated, how much more energy as well as how much more prone uh, to injury. I'm sorry, I think I said energy instead of injury. How much more energy it takes and how more prone to injury you are with knees and feet turned out like that in that externally rotated position. Um, so at this point people go, okay, this, this makes all kinds of sense, but how, what causes, how did, I, how did I get this way? We've heard me time and time again in this series say that form follows function. Well, you know, why does a bodybuilder look big and muscular the way they are? It's because they train their bodies to be so. Why does a runner have such like long stride or anything? Because they train their body to do so. So physically we look the way we do, muscle wise, body fat wise, body composition wise, because of how we train. Well your posture isn't any different. Whether, regardless of whether you meant to train your posture or you didn't, that anterior pelvic tilt and those externally rotated femurs is because you trained your body to do so. 
And if you don't believe me, I'll show you. So let's say you're a football player, right? You're getting ready, hike. Well, what are you doing? You're an external rotation, and you're trying to generate that anterior pelvic tilt because this is a strong foundation for you to tackle someone at, right? Um, let's think of you know basketball. Okay, you're here and you're guarding someone from getting from getting past you. Okay, uh, volleyball. You know you're here and you're going to set up your team member. You know so they can spike it. Point. Um, baseball. Okay, a catcher or even a shortstop or just waiting out in the field. You know you got that ready stance. Um, you know bodybuilding. Obviously you're doing squatting, so that's going to be anterior pelvic tilt, external femur rotation, as well as you know a lot of the other sports I previously mentioned use squats uh, for training to get stronger. And that's the key thing here, is that you're training these muscles to get stronger. So it's no surprise that your posture is in a very strong anterior pelvic tilt and very strong external femur rotation because you train it to be. Now, you might have figured out like, oh, you left out dancing and ping pong. Well, ping pong is the same thing. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You're behind the or at least good ping pong form, you're behind the table and you're doing this, and maybe you play for you know a couple hours. But again, same position. Dancing, I just didn't show because I have white boy syndrome. I got two, maybe three left feet. I shouldn't be teaching anybody to dance. Inter interesting story though, is I have a lot of female friends that are dancers, whether it be ballet, jazz, hip hop, combination of them. And whenever I, you know, they're walking towards me and I greet them, hey, how's it going? And I notice they're walking totally duck footed. I'm like, what are you doing? Because they know what I do for a living. And their response, and your response, if you're a dancer, you know what they're going to say is, but well, we're trained to do this in dance class. You know, we're trained to have our feet turned up. I said, that's fine. You know, when you're in dance class, I get it. You know, the ballet and, and all that stuff, that's great. And I'm not telling you how to dance. I'm the last person to tell anybody how to dance. Um, but, okay, now you're out of dance class. You know, maybe you were training for one, two, three hours, whatever. But now you're in the real world. And it's not a musical. We're not, you know, dancing and singing everywhere. Or at least we don't in my town, but, you know, maybe yours is different. Um, so that's the thing is when you're outside of dance class, your feet should be able to return to a neutral position where the knees and feet point straight ahead at 12 o'clock. Now, when I ask them to try to turn their feet straight, they go, oh, it feels so unnatural and it feels like I'm forcing. I go, well, right now you are. So instead of forcing them to turn straight, which is very uncomfortable and it feels very awkward and weird, why don't we take this approach? We know there's muscles that are causing the external rotation. Why don't we stretch those out and, here's the big thing, and strengthen the muscles that internally rotate. So we just rebalance. You'll still be able to do all your dance moves actually better than you were before. Same thing in basketball, football. You'll still be able to perform. I take that back. You'll be able to perform better than you were before. But now when you're not playing your sport, you're actually going to be in a better position when you're just walking around and doing your, you know, your everyday, um, you know, things. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of muscle involved as far as what causes this, but if I were to kind of simplify it, it's simply that your hip flexors, the muscles that move your leg forward, and the hip extensors that move your leg back have become dysfunctional, and as a result of that, your ab and adductors, your outer inner thighs, have taken over as a way to compensate. So your legs turned out, and now you kind of, instead of flexing at the hip forward, your inner thigh contracts and goes, okay, we're going to kind of pull this inward and forward-ish. You know, it's not the most efficient way to move. Like I said, it leads to, you know, a lot of chronic pain symptoms and possible injury. So you don't want to move that way. But your body's doing the best it can with, you know, what stimulus you're feeding it. So all you have to do, you don't have to quit your sport. You don't have to, you know, go, okay, now it's dribbling left-handed, I'm gonna go dribble right-handed or vice versa. You just have to feed your body some stimulus to balance out the muscles and get your body functioning properly, okay? And that's what the exercises down below this video are for. Now, there's gonna be one in particular that you might look and go, okay, this must be a typo of everything. It's the supine groin stretch, it says hold for 15 minutes per side. It's not a typo. Yes, I do mean 15 minutes per side. If you have more time, spend more time in it. And when you see the video, you're going to go, well, it's just lying there doing nothing. And essentially, you're right. That is what it's doing. But because of the position you're in, what it does is it really helps tame the hip flexor and other groin muscles that, again, because athletes, they train all this area to be really, really strong, it's tough to just 
we're going to stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. Really, what I found to be the most effective is you need to put it into position and allow those muscles to relax on their own. And that's why it requires the amount of time that, that it does. And I find that 15 minutes is bare minimum. For a lot of people, the stronger the athlete, the bigger the athlete, the more muscular they are, they need 30 minutes, 45 minutes. In extreme, extreme conditions, maybe even an hour per side. But start with 15 minutes and see how you do, okay? So, you know, try, check your symptoms before you do these exercises. Also, if there's a uh, range of motion that you're missing, like we, we uh, touched on earlier, like a physical limitation, like maybe bringing your knee up how high, test that out. Then do the exercises and see how you do afterwards, okay? I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a message in the comment section below. You can call me, email me, message your pigeon, smoke signal, you name it, I'm on it, all right? Anyways, thank you for joining me inside today's video. I look forward to seeing you inside the next one. Until then, take care and keep moving.